Good morning and welcome to the 18th meeting in 2015 of the Finance Committee of the Scottish Parliament. Can I please remind everyone to turn off any mobile phones, tablets or other electronic devices. We have received apologies from Richard Baker, MSP. His train was cancelled this morning, so he's running late, but he'll try and get here. And lo and behold, he's just walked here. through the door. Well done, Richard. Cheers. So, full compliment for you, Minister, today. Our first piece of business today is to decide whether to take items 3, 4, 5, 6 and 7 in private and whether to consider the draft report on our Scotland's fiscal framework inquiry and our work programme in private if future meetings are members agreed. Yes. Members have indicated their agreement. Our second item of business is to take evidence on the early years change fund from the Acting Minister for Children and Young People. Uh, Ms McLeod is joined today by Amanda Callaghan of the Scottish Government. I welcome our witnesses to the meeting and invite the Minister to make an opening statement. Thank you and good morning, convener and committee. Um, thank you for inviting me here today to give evidence on the Early Years Change Fund, which, as you know, is a partnership fund between the Scottish Government, local government and the National Health Service. Community planning partnerships submit annual returns to the Scottish Government on their change fund activity. When Aileen Campbell addressed the committee in January 2014, we only had information from CPPs about the first year of the change fund activity in 2012-13. We now have the second year of returns available to us for the 2013-14 activity. And I should at this point apologise for the delay in making this information available, but we only received the last CPP return on the 19th of May this year. The returns give us an indication of how CPPs are progressing in their journey to deliver transformational change in early years services and the part that the Change Fund has made in that journey. I have been heartened by the picture from the latest returns because we can see progress being made in terms of giving the early years the priority it deserves and real tangible examples of how CPPs are doing this in their everyday work. This is the very nature of what a change fund is about, delivering a different way of doing things. For example, in Western Bartonshire, they have attached a speech and language link officer to each early education and childcare centre, and that allows them to address waiting times and to ensure that the right referrals are made to speech and language services. This is also the first year that we've been able to capture some sense of the actual spend of the CPPs. Our calculations indicate just over £100 million across Scotland has been invested in early years activity through the Change Fund. This is above the minimum commitment from all the partners to spend £89 million in year two. But we must recognise the challenge associated with gathering information on spend in relation to the Change Fund activity. And in doing so, we've had to make a number of judgment calls on what to include as part of providing an estimated level of spend. For example, one CPP provided figures on their total integrated children's services budget, which we have not included within our total, as our judgment is that not all of that money relates to the change fund. The conclusion we can therefore draw are only as good as the information we're able to gather. Nevertheless, despite these challenges, we can see real progress this year. All 32 CPPs provided examples of prevention, and in year two, we have received examples of disinvestment for the very first time. For example, in Dundee, they are responding to feedback from the community on the type of services the community needs by moving away from standalone social work family centres to reinvesting in locally based teams to deliver a family orientated approach to services. The Early Years Collaborative, our national quality improvement programme that enables local practitioners to test and develop evidence-based early year services at the local level, was given as an example of how change was being delivered in every single return. As Sir Harry Burns said when attending the committee alongside Aileen Campbell in January last year, and I quote from him, I would not be the least bit surprised if 20 years from now, because of the change fund, we shut a prison because of the preventative work we are doing now in the early years. So in conclusion, convener, I've been very heartened by the progress that I've read about, and I will shortly be requesting the year three returns from CPPs, which I'm sure will provide yet more examples of how we are giving the early years the priority the evidence tells us it deserves. 
Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for that very uh, helpful uh, introductory statement. Uh, I mean, turning to the 2013-14 returns, you said the last submission was on the 19th of May. But when is it likely to be published? The 13, 14. It's on the website, is that right? Um, the actual returns are. The returns are now on the website. Oh, so when? So is there, a, is there going to be a full report published on that? Doing doing the summary. Um, I think. Are we going to do that this year, or are we going to wait till next year? Um, we will do a summary um, similar to the one we haven't we haven't completed it yet. Um, so over the summer. Well, All right. Okay, that's fine. So should be ready to now, <clears throat> just to go into the meat of it a wee bit, uh, in March, the, the committee took evidence from the Auditor General for Scotland and the Chair of the Accounts Commission on Audit Scotland's report, Community Planning, uh, Turning Ambition into Action. And in that evidence, uh, the Auditor General uh, highlighted that, um, and I quote, despite the focus on this issue and the effort that has been put into prevention, with policy shifts and introduction of the change funds, the amount of money that we are shifting is very small and at the margins. And I think in that regard, he's looking at the, the, the 2.7 billion invested in early year services and that relative to that, it's still fairly small. Uh, what's your, your comment on that? Well, I would say that this is a, a large amount of money that we're working in partnership over a three year period. Um, it's money that's being invested and with the returns, especially this year, as I said in my introductory remarks, we're beginning to see change happening and we're beginning to see some disinvestment. I think 10 out of the 32 returns showed examples of disinvestment because of the change fund investment. Yes, I mean, you'll, you'll know obviously that the, one of the committee's concerns has been the lack of disinvestment in order, uh, um, in order to invest in the... Uh, um, uh, in other areas where uh, returns are much more significant. Uh, I mean, for example, th there are still some concerns I have. I mean, if, if you look at what the Inverclyde Alliance said, they said, and I quote, disinvestment will happen much further in the future once early intervention and prevention approaches take effect. This can be generational, 20 to 30 years. I, mean, I take it the Scottish Government are looking for much more rapid progress across the board and, and not, um, you know, I appreciate what you've said about, you know, there may be a, a present we won't have to have in 20 or 30 years, but you're really looking for much more significant changes in much shorter term periods, aren't you? Well, I think you've got to remember what the, the, the change fund is there over a three year period to almost like seed fund with the local authorities and the, the community planning partnerships that there is the, the, the evidence to move towards preventative spend is the right evidence and it does work and I think you know as you said and you know quoting Harry Burns again we are seeing changes already but the real change this is a journey so the three years will allow us to find the evidence to then roll out but it is generational this is about working on the early years to ensure that people in their later years get the benefits of a good start. I mean, if you, if you look, though, at uh, what, what Works Scotland actually said in evidence to the committee, they said, though, I mean, smoking bill is an obvious example. There can be opportunities where prevention can have more immediate effects. I think one of the concerns the committee has had is that, you know, we, the, 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 this finance committee and its predecessors have been talking about prevention and disinvestment for years, and we're only now seem to be having, touching on, on the kind of margins. Um, I mean, how, is there any sense of frustration the Scottish Government that um, prevention is not taking place much quicker and that results are not clearer and, and more obvious? I, I wouldn't, I, no, I wouldn't say frustration because I think what we're seeing is this journey that we're on. But there's a, there's a one, one wonderful example that I was reading about, which is Child Smile, um, which is the money that we've invested in... Um, teeth brushing in nursery schools and the you know I'll send them to you but the figures on that of how much I think it's a 1.8 million investment in getting every child at nursery school to do their teeth brushing every day and we're seeing already the numbers of children having to go for for example fillings having gone down and the estimate is that that has saved five million pounds in dental treatment for a 1.8 million pound investment and that's only been over a few years, but we're beginning to see that. Um, there's another lovely example. You're talking about smoking cessation in uh, my own constituency in Eastern Bartonshire, where with the early, in, early years change fund, where they've intervened with pregnant mums to get them to stop smoking. And their rate 
of smoking in pregnancy has gone down, I think, and I'd have to check the figures again, from something like 37% to 20%. So, again, very, you, we are seeing some very early good returns. OK. Now, one of the things that... Um, that uh, the, the committee has also um, considered is that uh, there have been a number of projects funded by early uh, years change fund monies, but I mean it's it's not clear, and uh, certainly from the returns that have come in before, uh, how many of these were already being funded before um, the early change fund monies came in, and so there's concern that um, a lot of good projects would have happened in any case, and so there's not really an additionality factor with some of these. What, what's the Scottish Government done to look at that and find out what, the, what difference has been made in terms of new projects rather than just funding being, dis, you know, being put into existing projects? That is one of the things that it goes back to the heart of how do, you, how do you collect these figures and then how do you analyse them? There's a certain amount of judgement that has to be made when the figures come in from the CPP about whether you know, it's a move in funding, whether it's early years change fund, um, so that, that is not always an easy judgment to make. And we've tended, the analysis that we've been doing has tended to be quite conservative. Um, so we do believe that we are seeing, a, you know, real use of the Early Years Change Fund, real benefit from it. But we're also seeing the use of existing money because that's kind of what this is all about, is getting it all together. Now, the projects that you've mentioned that have been successful over the three years of the fund, uh, what's happening to those projects? Uh, has there been any analysis as to whether they're continuing to be funded from mainstream resources or uh, how many have been stopped, etc.? What's actually happening with these projects? Because clearly what you want is good projects to continue uh, and uh, um, over a number of years, you don't just want them to, to end because the funds end. You know that the partnership money ends this year, but the Scottish Government has decided to put in £8.5 million for the next financial year. And that's really about um, making sure that the projects have sustainability in them so that those that are good continue on. We have, in the monitoring form, I went through uh, one of the monitoring forms, and it is quite interesting that we're, you know, at um, 4.2, we're asking how will you measure the impact of this activity um, that you've been funding? And we're beginning to get that back. But again, it's back to the analysis involves some judgment calls. Yeah. On that, I mean, you, you talked about, for example, you know, uh, uh, early on about the, the, the difference in uh, money that's been accounted for in terms of some of these projects. I mean, I looked at, for example, the spend by a local authority and... Um, you know, the Outer Hebrides is putting down £11.8 million, and yet Glasgow is only putting down £4.4 .4 million. There's clearly big differences in terms of the reporting here. I understand, for example, that, that uh, you know, that, that some, some local authorities, I assume the he Outer Hebrides being one of them, although I don't know why it's called Outer Hebrides and not Western Isles or Alien Shire, but um, why that? I mean, it looks as if they include core funding such as nursery provision. In terms of the reporting, is there anything that the Scottish Government is doing to, to, to kind of look at that in greater depth to see where, where, the, where we actually are with those funds? Yeah, um, again, it's back to the monitoring form has changed between year one and year two. And so the year two monitoring form, um, for example, at 4.4 .4 says, can you provide specific examples of preventative spend? And in my opening remarks, I was talking about um, the fact that one of the CPPs sent in, you know, their global um, sum that they had spent on uh, the integrated children's services budget. You know, so it becomes quite... So I think there was a change in the monitoring form from year one to year two. Year two was asking much more specific. Are we considering asking even more specific in year three? Yes, um, and questions that relate to the three-year total as well as the individual year. So I think it is about learning the way that we're asking the questions as we've gone along, having learned in year one that it is very complicated, not just for us to read what, there is, what, what we're being told, but actually also for the CPPs to work out you know, from which budget they can clearly show the spend is coming from. So year one to year two, we change the monitoring form. We'll do it again um, for this year. OK, just a bit, but it's, it's not clear why the report of spend over and above the Early Years Change Fund was requested by the Early Years Task Force. 
What was the thinking behind that? Because the, the early years task force is very much about um, tests of change. Uh, and not just standalone tests of change, but tests of change within the system that we're already working in. So for them, it's important to ask that question to see if the test of change would have happened without the early years change fund money in the first place. OK. OK, well, thank you for that. I'm going to open out the session now to colleagues around the table. The first person to ask questions will be John to be followed by Mark. Hey, thanks, convener. Uh, I mean, the convener has touched on kind of the wide range of issues that uh, I think I'm also interested in. Uh, so probably it's going to just develop some of these questions. I mean, the whole question of preventative spend, and this isn't just for children, it's for across the board. I mean, do you think it's really possible to pin down that, you know, X pound, this pound, is a preventative pound? Because it seems to me that very often, you know, there's two ways of looking at things. I mean, if somebody's in hospital, it's a reaction to something that's happened maybe beforehand, so it's not preventative. But on the other hand... It is preventative because it's stopping something worse happening to them. So, do you think it is possible to define all of this? Can I go back to the child smile example? Because I think that is... First, I think it's a very difficult... It is a very difficult concept to follow the pound and work out what the pound gave you in terms of prevention and early spend. But again, it's, it's about, is there anything we can look at and get concrete examples? And I think the child smile one is a very concrete example where you can show that it was 1.8 million pounds spent in nursery schools on toothbrushes, toothpaste, all those sort of things, getting them to do that and then see that the prevention is less children having to get fillings. So, but is that, can you say that it's because they brushed their teeth at nursery school that they had less fillings? Or is it because we were doing healthy eating with them and they were eating less sweets, so they had less fillings? But you can clearly see, I th can you clearly see that's what, I think that's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, no, I think that's a fair, I think that's a good example. I think that is clearer than some examples, because I think clearly the, the money that was put into the schools and the tooth brushing is absolutely, by my understanding, preventative. I'm interested, the five million saving, I mean, can you tell us anything about that? I mean, does that mean there's one or two dentists lost their jobs? Or um, is it just like a saving in equipment so they didn't have to buy so many fillings? Or is, is there, has the, there work it, been done in that five million? The, my understanding is the five million is what it would have cost to have given all those fillings that we no longer gave. But of course, that's the thing about preventative spend. You, you know, you're saying that there, there were less fillings, therefore were there less dentists. But we've now got, I think, what is the figure for, for children registered with a dentist? It's 93% or something. You know, so that's part of that as well. You know, so although there's less fillings, there's more kids understanding or more parents understanding that. Take them for the checkup every year. I, mean, I think that's a perfectly fair answer. It does, though, I suppose, confirm my concern that when we say there's a saving... Sometimes it's not like a real saving that we've suddenly got five million yeah. at the end of the year yeah. in our no. pocket we can do something else with. But, but yeah. immediately the, it gets filled up by more people registering at yeah. the dentist or the dentist is able to do some other work yeah. or that kind yeah. of thing. And I mean, that, I, I suppose this is more a question I'll need to ask John Swinney at some point rather than yourself. But, uh, you know, how do we pin this down? Because some of these savings, you know, they can easily get spent uh, again without uh, us doing very much. I, I mean, in some of the examples that have been given to, the, the convener made the point that, you know, sometimes the savings are really going to be quite a long way down the line, but I accept your dental one is quite a quick one. Um, I mean, do you think there's sometimes the case where we need to, you know, cut some spending now in order to invest, put more money into preventative? Because it seems to me that we are only putting a little in. And yet, to say close a prison or close a hospital would be a very major thing to do, but it would free up resources for intervention. But, but isn't that the essence of what we're going through with the preventative and early intervention, is that you're investing now for a longer-term outcome? So it is, that, it is a generational thing, and we have to accept that and work on that. Yeah, I mean, and that's where it becomes yeah. very difficult. Yes. Um, and you were saying, you know, show the saving. Um, isn't the word that, that is used continually disinvestment, which I, th I just wish we could think of a, a better description for if you invest in prevention and early intervention, 
ultimately you will not need to invest in um, you know, sort of chronic long-term care. Yes, and I suppose my question is really how quickly you try and do that and do you really cut into some of the current services in order to re free resources? I mean, I think there was a case in the States where they were thinking about building a prison and there was a need for that prison, but they decided not to do it and to put the money into early intervention, stopping young people being part of the system. And I think in the long term that may have been successful, but it did mean there wasn't a prison there that was actually probably needed. Um, and that's the kind of more dramatic, you know, hurting cuts or disinvestment that I just wonder if we need to be doing more of. Well, I can't think of a big dramatic like one like that in my um, portfolio, but prisons brings to mind the fact that we've just made the decision not to build the women's prison at Inverclyde. That's a long-term... Uh, you know, change in the way that we invest. And of course that will impact uh, in my portfolio because less women in prison means less children separated from their mothers. Okay, that's helpful. Thanks so much. Thanks. Just before I, 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 you know, I let uh, Mark in, these projects that have been looked at and analysed, etc., etc., the ones that are successful, is the Scottish Government making any, any effort to see them being rolled out across Scotland if a project is working very successfully? What are you doing to ensure that they're picked up by other uh, the community that, planning partnerships? And can I, community one of, that's partnerships. one of the um, joys that I discovered when I came into this job was the Early Years Collaborative, which is the way that when folk are working on something and find that it works, they come together and share that. And it's not so much about the government rolling it out as about all the people on the front line sharing their experiences and taking it home and going, that worked there Let's us do it here. I went to one of the learning set, one of the learning sessions of the Early Years Collaborative with 700 frontline professionals, and it's just a great experience to be part of, where professionals feel empowered to one come up with a project, give it a try, and then share it, but also being empowered to share when it didn't work, because if we're investing in early intervention and find that something doesn't work then that's a lesson to share with everybody rather than have somebody else do the same thing. I think we're all quite familiar with Early as Collaborative, but I mean, is there any examples of a project which started off, for example, in East Lothian has now been implemented in Highlands or Ayrshire or wherever it happens to be, you know? I can't think of one off the top of my head. Um, let me, a lot, well, a lot of the stuff we're doing on play, for example, um, which is, you know, comes from, we've got the, the play strategy, but we've also got things now like the Play Rangers Toolkit, which is about, and that is now, you know, a couple of local uh, areas said, let's do more stuff outside. And they, they talk about, when they're talking about outdoor early education, they talk about um, uh, risk benefit analysis. That's not the right term, but it's something like that, where you, you've got to encourage the children to, t to take a risk, because by taking a risk, you learn and therefore uh, become there's lots of evidence about how it helps you in all sorts of ways. So a couple of projects were doing that. It worked. So we, so I launched the, Air, the, Air, the Play Rangers Toolkit, which had that all there, so that anybody, any local authority, MD that wants to take children outside to play, has now got a toolkit where, you know, they can counter the sort of elf and safety culture that we live in which says you've got to wrap a kid up in cotton wool and they've now got a toolkit to use all around the country that says this is how you assess a risk and decide if it's worth moving well, on. Well, last point, I will let colleagues pack in. I apologise to, to my colleagues here. But, just, um, but is there any direction of this? I mean, you're talking about these folk getting together and talking about what works and what doesn't work, but is there anything that you say, look, this is something we think you should do? Is there any sense of direction being done? Is there any, is the Scottish Government actually saying, well, this is something we think you should do? Yeah. As opposed well, to just letting them kind of do yeah. it organically? What, yeah. What I will do is at the, end, every, at the end of every learning session at the Early Years Collaborative, there are decisions made about what we're going to work on, what we're going to look at in the future, what areas we're going to work on, and I can send all that to you, especially from the last one. Um, so it's things about, you know, what key changes do we need to work on, and therefore that's what we would like the collaborative to go out and test for us over the next period. OK, thank you for that. Uh, Mark, to be followed by Malcolm. Uh, th thank you, Convener. Um, <clears throat> I just wondered, in terms of 
um, in terms of buy-in to the to the change that, that the Scottish Government wants to see. Um, one of the things I remember when I was Vice Convener of Housing at Aberdeen City Council was trying to convince other departments of the Council that the concept of regeneration didn't just relate to, to building more houses. There was a wider issue that other departments had a buy-in to. In terms of early years change fund, obviously there are a range of services out there which uh, could be making changes to the way they deliver services uh, in order to facilitate some of the early intervention that, that the Scottish Government wants to see. So I guess the question would be is while, while you're here sat in front of us uh, as the Minister for Children and Young People, what, what level of buy-in do you have from other government departments, ministers and also at a local level beyond simply local authorities being seen as the drivers of this? What, uh, what further buy-in is there beyond that? I could speak. I can speak as the minister um, and say that there there is buy-in um, across the government, um, across different portfolios. If you um, you know take again, you know the, the the decision not to build the Inverclyde Women's Prison, um, that's very much a justice issue, but it's not. That's also seen clearly as that will have an effect on young people and bonding. Um, it's also an effect on women's employment things like that. So there is that clear um, joined up. And of course, as of Monday, um, that becomes much more uh, <coughs> something that is going to happen, not just in government, but across uh, all uh, agencies. Because as of Monday, part one of the Children and Young People's Act says that uh, ministers have to give cognizance to the rights of young people. <coughs> and the early years, you know, this, we're talking very much about interventions in the early years and about funding for interventions in the early years. But the bottom of all of that is about a child's right, a child's right to get access to services that are best for them. So that's clearly embedded. But it was interesting, one of the um, uh, returns that I printed out and read through in great detail was North Lanarkshire's. And it's interesting to see North Lanarkshire talking about their partner organisations in doing this. You know, so they're talking about across the council, across the health board, Police Scotland, the voluntary sector, but also parents and children. So I think from year one to year two, we're seeing in the returns that this is becoming embedded in culture across different organisations. Uh, you mentioned the that from I think, 10 local authority returns, you'd seen evidence of disinvestment taking place. And I guess the, 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 the optimist says that's great to see. The, the pessimist says, well, what's happening in the other 22 local authorities and why are they not taking those approaches? So what, what, what work's the Scottish Government doing to interrogate further with those 22 local authorities? Because uh, if we can look at the Older People's Change Fund as an example, um, the, one of the concerns that I've had at a local level with the Older People's Change Fund was it was kind of used for three years and then the projects that were funded were kind of packed up once the funding stopped. Um, and there wasn't really a, 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 a concerted effort to mainstream some of these and perhaps look at how the funding was being spent in other areas and maybe have that disinvestment and, and put it into some of these projects. It was kind of a a short-termism when what we want to encourage is more long-term thinking. So what work's being done with those other 22 to say, look, you need to start showing some evidence that this funding isn't just there as a kind of stopgap for you? Yeah. Um, I referred earlier to the fact that the, we're now in year three of the three-year funding, but the Scottish Government has committed £8.5 million for a fourth year. Um, we're not looking to our partners. That's just our funding, and that is very much about how at the end of the three years, can we ensure sustainability? And uh, I mean, just just to go a little bit further on that, though, I mean, the, the sustainability is 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 fine in in terms of where local authorities are showing a, a willingness and a and a move towards mainstreaming and, and perhaps changing ways of working. Is it with the other twenty two where there hasn't been that evidence of disinvestment? Is it a concern that? they're not maybe to making those changes or is it just perhaps that they haven't presented the evidence on, on to the Scottish Government as yet but they may well be doing that work behind the scenes? My suspicion that is the latter but yeah. if I can let... Um, yes, I, I think the interpretation of what disinvestment means has been applied differently. Uh, I think um, 
it's good to see 10 examples sorry, uh, of it, but I don't think that is an indication that none of the others are, are doing that. Um, and there is some work going on with the Early Years Collaborative around support um, for CPP areas um, to help identify sort of tests of change and things that work and, and to work through some of that as well through the work of the Early Years Collaborative. Obviously, there are... Uh, and you mentioned Child Smile, and that's you know a, a very welcome initiative. Um, and there are some quick wins that you can identify off the back of some of the investment. Some of the investment is going to be a much longer term thing before you could really see a benefit. You know, talking maybe one two decades before you would see a real shift. Um, do you think that there is the the mindset out there that says we're in this for the long haul with some of these projects and some of this investment because you know the the nature of the political world in which we live is that we look for results that we can present at five four or five year intervals to say look we've made some progress here do you think that there is that collective buy-in to say look we're in this for the long haul we know that it will be maybe 10 years before this pound or or this million pounds shows absolutely positive outcomes but we're in it for the long haul on that and everybody's on the same same track I, th I think we are and I think you know the political cycle aside um, although no, it's not the political cycle a lot of these things in four and five years are beginning we're beginning to get evidence of change getting evidence of benefit for the child but also getting evidence of change in the funding so within the political cycle you probably can go out and trumpet a success but the biggest thing is it's a generational change um but if, as you are building up your if it has to be in four and five year increments if you're building that up then within five cycles you've just changed a generation okay thanks Okay, Gavin, to be uh, Malcolm, sorry, to be followed by Gavin. Um, I was going to ask about the earliest collaborative, but the convener obviously started off on that, but this is obviously very important to this agenda. I noticed from the Edinburgh report it said during 2013-14 there were 20 active early years collaborative projects in Edinburgh. So I, I suppose you've said something about the collaborative, but I'm interested in just hearing a bit more do you think that's quite typical of local authorities across Scotland when it talks about 20 active projects? But I suppose, well, there are several questions about the collaborative, but I suppose another one would be to what extent, I mean, how it's a methodology, an improvement methodology, but I suppose the key thing is to find the right, um, the right activities which are actually going to deliver the results that we want in terms of preventative spend. So who decides what the key actions are that are going to be um, tested as it were and and so on 20 in edinburgh um if my memory serves me right there's about 500 across the country um and that sounds like a huge number doesn't it 500 but they're small tests of change and because of that it's really about the local the locality saying here's a change that we think could work here so it's very much devolved to the folk on the ground saying, I think if I tried this, it would make a difference. And that is the beauty of this. And that's why there's so many of them. But it's also the beauty of it is you can, in a short pe period of time, test a change, see if it works. If it works, continue it. If it doesn't, think again. I mean, that sounds very decentralised, but is there not... Um you know, at the, at the big national gatherings, are, I mean, are there not some um, kind of objectives that are kind of accepted? Everyone's going to try this and see what, I mean... No, no, know. not everyone's going to try this, no, but, um, we, but they set out, um, um, what, what do they call them again? Key, key changes. Key changes that, that we want to explore um, in the next period. But those key changes are very much arrived at by the collaborative. Um, when I was at the last one, um, I went to the session on play and the discussion was about whether that should become a key change. And it was really interesting to sit there and listen to the discussion. And in the end, they decided that it would be a key change. So we'll now see a lot more work happening on play as, as part of the early intervention agenda because the collaborative decided that that was a key change. 
I mean, I noticed Dumfries and Galloway return it said initially it was assumed that spreading the improvement methodology would lead to changes in services which would impact positive employment. This approach had previously worked well in the NHS patient safety um, programme. Um, however, we have learned that in a multi-agency context it is necessary to provide more structure to the proposed changes. I mean, has there been much discussion of um, you know, how easy local authorities have found to adopt this methodology, which started very much in health, but it seems to be quite different for the early years. I mean, I've, I don't quite know what the background to that quote is from Dumfries and Galloway. I'll get Amanda to come mm. in on that, but I would think that um, the Early Years Task Force, which I've attended once, I'm sure you've been at more of them than I have, uh, Malcolm, um, that's the kind of thing that it's at that level that that would be discussed, but I'll get Amanda to... Also, within, within the work of the collaborative and the parts that our team supports, um, there is some work going on with uh, improvement advisors, specifically within regions. This is quite early, um, and we're actually at the process of testing to see what works, so what things are actually possible to scale up in local authority areas. And then the idea will be that that spreads and we provide that support to local authority areas to identify both the key changes that nationally we've identified are the big things that will make the biggest difference, but also um, locally that that's applied in a way that is appropriate because different things work better in different places. So, um, so we're it, on that journey, and uh, it, it's not. It, sh we should be making a lot of progress over the over the next year on that. Okay. Well, thanks. And perhaps I should go to one of the collaboratives. I've, I've been to a health one, but I haven't been to the early years collaborative. But it's obviously very important, and it's one of these things. I think it would be good if MSPs knew more about it, because obviously people are putting a lot of faith on it. Highly recommend a um, visit. So that's that one. Um, well, I think disinvestment's been well dealt with in a way, but I was, I was looking at um, something that your, the minister, your predecessor minister said about uh, the committee about it um, not considering disinvestment alone to be a key indicator for prevention, and yet obviously the change fund returns ask for specific examples of dis disinvestment to be provided. So I, I don't know if there's some tension between those two statements or not really. I mean, how... How would you see in that sense if it's not an indicator, but you still want to see some indication that is taking place? Yeah. <laughs> yes, you're right. And you know, um, on the monitoring form, um, 4.4 is can you provide specific examples of preventative spend? 4.5, specific examples of disinvestment. And that comes back to what is the change fund for? It's about trying to move um, the way that we fund services to early intervention rather than just always thinking about how we react to a crisis. Um, so, yeah, I don't, I don't think there's an inherent tension there. Um, no, there probably isn't. There might appear to be one. Perhaps there isn't one. And finally, savings. John Mason dealt with savings, but I suppose the question on that is, to what extent are we thinking of savings as financial savings, or to what extent do we have a broader view of savings in the sense of it will save lots of undesirable things happening to people in the future, or is it a bit of both? Well, I think com when it comes to the money, I don't think we should talk about saving. We should talk about um, this disinvest or reinvestment in early, you know, um, I'd like a better word than disinvestment, but so I think in financial terms, um, it's about moving money to the right place to deliver the long-term outcome. In terms of the actual outcome for young people, that is a saving, because it is saving them from, you know, their mother smoking in pregnancy and all that follows for the child in the, in the rest of their lives. You know, it is a saving in, in terms of, or it's an investment. It's an investment in their early years to ensure better later years. Would that be a... Toothbrushing and nursery, you could argue it would still be preventative spend even if it didn't save a penny, although you're arguing it does save a penny, but it would, you could argue it would still be preventative yeah. spend either yeah. way. Well, it, it's two things, isn't it? It's, it's um, the, the, the toothbrushing saves children from tooth decay, so there's a saving. Um, but it also moves money from fillings to better support for oral health. OK, thank you. Thank you. Gavin, to be followed by Jean. Yeah, thank you. Um, Minister, what happens to the 
early years change fund now? Because you mentioned uh, the eight and a half billion pounds from the Scottish Government, presumably for 15, 16. Yeah. But other than that, eight and a half million, I mean, is that effectively the end of the early years change fund as we know it? Uh, yes. Yeah. 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 yeah, it was the original, original agreement. Yeah. Okay. It was only set out to be the partnership for three years. Then the government decided to put the extra in for the fourth year to get sustainability. But can a change fund last forever? It has to be, you know, for a period to try and effect the change. Okay. Um, so, so, I mean, the, the government's intention then is that the chain, that is that is the end of the change fund as as such, apart from the, the ENAF. Okay. In terms of um, in terms of judging the success of the change fund over the three year period, what mechanisms are in place, and how will you judge the overall? Clearly, there's some individual successful projects which you've identified, which I, I, I concur with uh, the committee members' remarks upon them, but. The fund as a whole will have to be judged, you know, £274 million over three years. What did we actually get for it? How will that be judged? And can you just explain the mechanism of how the government will report back on that? Um, what, we're, we're at the moment just thinking about what you do at the end of the project. And I think it is um, about looking at, um, you know, committing to an analysis of all the returns we've had, an analysis of the changes we've seen. Um, and I think that would be something that, you know, I'd like to say to the committee that that's something we'd like to commit ourselves to, um, you know, is to analyse um, with, par with the partners, because this isn't just about government money, it's about local authority money, NHS money. So it's how, you know, how at the end of the three years can we an analyse what happened over those three years and then learn the lessons? Okay. Um, now, you obviously don't have all of the 14 or maybe any of the 14, 15 returns in yet. No. But you've got the first two years worth. In, in terms of, so you haven't done the full external analysis as such, but you must have a feel as, as a minister who's read presumably all of these returns. What, what is, how successful has the change fund been as a whole over the first two years for which you have data? Bearing, bearing in mind, I, I accept some of the benefits will be longer term, and so you can't capture all of those, but you must have a feel overall of how successful it's been over the first two years. Yeah, but is it fair to talk, you know, to, to talk about having a feel rather than looking at, you know, what evidence have we got and how can we analyse it? Um, my feeling is this is moving in the right direction. My feeling is that these, especially the small tests of change by frontline practitioners, is a very successful way to actually effect change. These are my feelings. Um, at the end of, of it, we, you know, the analysis will show if my gut feeling is right. Um, but I think we've got enough just from year one to year two to see that the returns are giving more data, more examples of change. You give some specific examples of uh, investments that were successful. Not every project will be successful, though. Um, there will be a degree of failure. And you said people were publicly happy to, to stand up at the early years collaborative in state. So what, what are the kind of projects that haven't worked and that, have, and that should not be continued? Being an optimist, I've only written down the ones that worked. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Can I come back to you? On sure, that? of course. I mean, I just think it's yeah. important if, if we are going to learn Absolutely. lessons. We, we have to be, because one of, one of the committee's frustrations is we hear lots of good stuff, I have to say, but nobody is prepared, and certainly in my experience, to say these things haven't worked and we, we need to stop doing them if we're going to yeah. prioritise. And I just think until we actually start doing that, it, it's more difficult yeah. to, to make progress. We, we do, I can't think off the top of my head, but sure. we do have um, a couple of video clips of people who have talked about things that have, haven't have worked and they're things that have um, been shared. So it's certainly we can send the committee um, those uh, examples as well and, and pull out any others we've got. Sure. Okay. Um, now, a number of people have asked you about disinvestment, and I accept you don't like the word and you want a new word, but sticking with that word for, for now until we come up with a better one, you, you did mention one project in your opening remarks about where there had been disinvestment. I think it was Dundee, if I wrote it down correctly. C can you just explain in more detail what, what actually happened there? Because it, it, it didn't, I, didn't, I didn't quite follow it. 
Um, I, what I was trying to, I guess I'm trying to see is what, what savings have, we, have then resulted from that disinvestment and what, what fundamental change was made? Is it able, are you able just to expand upon that? I think, I th can I write to you with the, the actual, because you know, what I've got is uh, you know, a couple of lines on it, sure. um, but it's one of the questions that I've asked on a few of the examples I was given. Now, there was one really good example, um, like manager. And again, I can't give you figures, but I asked what they would be, and that's the difficulty in this. So, Clack Manager put in an, uh, a mental health worker to actually work with parents in the services that the parents were at, rather than the parents having to go to mental health services to get support. And what Clack Manager were able to tell us was that because of that, some parents had come off of benefits because they were able to go back to work. Some parents had returned to work. Some parents had gone to college. Some children had been able to remove, be removed from the child protection register, all because of the way that they were putting the mental health worker in, where they were putting them in, and how the parents could access it. But when I said, well, can you tell me how many come off of benefits, how many children, they said, you can't be as specific as that. So it's back to this, you know, is it working? Can we put a penny and a pound on it? Or is it going in the right direction and it's at the in the long term we'll be able to see that in Clack Manager you would be able to see, you know, the number of children on the child protection register had dropped over a certain period of time, but it's back to was it because of the the way that they got access to a mental health worker or was it something else? Sure, no, no, I accept causation is never uh, absolute and, and straightforward, although you can you can quite often make links. I suppose that the, the key for me, though, with, with disinvestment is this. I mean, you've explained uh, something in Click Manager where uh, mental health workers were made available to, to families more readily. And without looking at the detail, I can see why that would help. Um, but that's not the disinvestment. What The disinvestment is what did they stop funding or what did they stop doing in order to free up the money to do yeah. something that sounds quite... And, and that's where, certainly from my point of view, the, there are just no details yeah. Um, yeah. over you several see, yeah. years. You see, for, my, for me, that one on, on the Clack Manager, what jumped out at me was that they said that there, were, there, was, there was less social work input in those families. Less, some children had been removed from the Child Protection Register. The disinvestment is less, child, less of those children will end up as looked-after children, and therefore we don't have to spend the money that it costs to support a child out with its own home. But how do you actually put the pounds and pennies on that? Okay. Well, anything you can, you can. I mean, I, I take. I, except you said you, you've only got uh, minor details just now. But anything I think you can share with us, particularly if you're getting follow-ups uh, personally, anyway, I would say it'd be uh, hugely, uh, hugely helpful. Yeah. We have uh, agreed with the task force to, to delve into the disinvestment examples we've got in, in more detail and we're working with them. So we'll make that available to the, to the committee as well. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. Eugene. Thank you very much, uh, convener. <clears throat> I wanted to go back. Uh, Minister, you mentioned about outdoor education as in one of your examples. And that was, I think, in answer to the question about rolling things out nationwide um, and you also mentioned uh, I think the phrase uh, we produced a toolkit of some sort what, what is that we is the, is the fund then held centrally and different local authorities are applying for different ideas or when it comes to the toolkit how does that fit into the fund does everybody buy into that or if, is if it's imposed, if you know what I mean, it, it being sold to everybody as here's a really good thing that does work, well, is there some kind of central fund or is that through another, a different fund? Play Ranger Toolkit was through a different fund. It's the, I'm not sure. is it the Inspiring, uh, Inspiring Scotland Fund? can't remember. I'll check and come back to you with what actual fund, but I was using that as the example of small change, small attempts at change, do outdoor education, and then what comes back is we actually need the manual, the handbook, whatever. We call it a toolkit because it shouldn't be you have to do it this way. So that can come back, and I, you can find a different central pot of money to say that's something that's proven good, so if we use this other pot of money to produce the toolkit, then everybody's got it. 
And that would be the same for the toothbrushes and the toothpaste and the um, that's yeah, the child, child smile, smile one, no, that is done through the NHS funding. Um so that is clearly a, a central fund, isn't yes, it? That's yeah. right. Okay. And just going back to Girfek and and where is that has that kind of spawned a lot of these ideas of collaborative working? Um is is Girfek now rolled out across all of Scotland? Uh, well, the principles of GERFEC, getting it right for every child, have, have been used for, what, 10 years now um, across different local authorities. And the reason uh, why we put it in the Children and Young People's Act last year was because we wanted it to be that it wasn't your, you know, everybody took this on and it had a statutory footing. So uh, GERFEC will actually come in in terms of the legislation in August next year as a legislative program. Yeah. And I suppose just uh, looking forward, the prediction is that um, children living in poverty in Scotland is on the rise. Um, whether we blame the austerity agenda or whatever, I guess it will have some effect, but an increase of 3 or 4% on already what is approaching quarter of a million children in Scotland. Um, this is going to bring a lot of pressure too uh, for priorities and so on. I mean, realistically, the predicted cuts for local authorities are fairly severe. I mean, how, how can you um, feel confident that some of these changes and disinvestments are, are reasonable and practical and possible? Yeah. Um, yeah. It's a bit, it was going a bit beyond the early years change fund, but there is a ministerial uh, working group on child poverty, which I'm on with um, the Minister for Welfare and also the Cabinet Secretary for Social Justice. Um, so it's a bit out with what we're talking about today, but the lessons that we have can learn from any of the early year change fund projects can be fed into that and hopefully become part of our way of trying to tackle child poverty. But then preventative spend is, is, is I think, uh, a really a sound um, philosophy and or a good basis for, for any, any budget. People understand it. It's hard sometimes to uh, articulate exactly in every, in every service what, what that looks like. But then isn't, I mean, that is why we've had the change fund for three years is to, you know, it is about that. It's really has got feeling is that if you spend on prevention, it's better than letting the accident happen. So that we've had three years in order to be able to test these changes. And then, you know, as I've said, well, uh, we can do the analysis with our partners at the end of the three years and get things embedded. And finally, uh, you mentioned uh, Harry, Dr. Harry Burns and his enthusiasm for the, has he been actively involved in some of the some of these reports or the evidence or so on? He, he was in when he was the chief medical officer. Um, he, he this you know he was intrinsic to this. Um, of course, he's no longer the chief medical officer, but you know that he was appointed to um, the economic advisors council. So I think that sends out a very positive message, and it will keep his enthusiasm being part of the work that we're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, that appears to have concluded the questions from the committee. Are there any further points you'd like to make uh, before we wind uh, No, but to say that I will follow up with um, the things that I said I would say. Okay, thank you. you very much for answering our questions. Uh, we you. agreed earlier on that the following items would be in private, so that ends the public uh, session. So I'd like to call a recess to 11 o'clock to allow the public uh, the Minister and Fisher Report to leave.